Thank you for coming, Marco Politi, on the occasion of this book, Pope Francis Among the Wolves, to turn to your book and reflect with you on what's really going on, not just in the United States, but Francis as a global figure who is the head of this Roman Curia, an international church, and what he is trying to do, what his challenges are. One thing that so many observers appreciate is that he is someone who matches actions and words that a critique of religion is often its hypocrisy, but he is someone who puts what he wants to see happen with all humanity into action personally. If you could first say just, how did he get like this? How did he turn into the person? Uh, what ethical sources, what influences is he drawing on to, to do it like he does it? Well, first of all, it must be said that to see the Pope so sure of himself on an international stage has been, after his election, a surprise for many because as Archbishop of Buenos Aires, he wasn't traveling a lot. He almost doesn't speak foreign languages. He speaks Spanish and Italian. He tried hard here in the United States. And, um, but there is one reason for this um, sense of uh, secureness which he has on the international stage. Uh, and it comes from the fact that this is the first pope born in a million inhabitants town. The, the night when he was elected and he went to the balcony, he spoke to the crowd saying, the brethren's cardinal called me from the end of the world. This is, shows the sense of humor of Pope Francis, but actually he's not coming from the end of the world. This is the first pope who wasn't born in a village, in a Bavarian village, in an Italian village, in a uh, German village. It makes a great difference if you are born in a little reality where almost all people is Catholic, or you are born in a town, in a city like Buenos Aires, which has a core of three, four millions, but the greater Buenos Aires is made of 14 million inhabitants. So he comes from a mega town where all economical and social situation and layers are present, where there are so many people from different ethnic roots not only Spanish, there are Italians, Swedish, German, Arabs, Russian, Chinese. And there is a great variety of religious beliefs and of cultural beliefs. There are Catholic, Protestants, free churches, Jews, Muslims, and a strong anti-clerical Freemasonry uh, tradition. So it is a man who was born and raised in a global society framework. And this explains why when he speaks, he doesn't speak only to Catholics and not only to Christians. He speaks beyond religious borders. He speaks to men and women as they are in contemporary society. And for him, he never, for instance, he underlined it, he never thought that an atheist non-believing in God was a sort of lame duck. He never thought things like that. Always you have had other religious personality, other uh, Catholic thinkers who always say, if a man or a woman doesn't believe in God, something lacks to this personality. But for um, Pope Francis, as he was read in this framework, this makes him capable to speak to the global society uh, today. Of course, uh, this also helps him to uh, be present on the crossroads of the great problems of the modern society. When he speaks about inequality, when he speaks about the cry of the excluded, of the marginalized, of the outcast, it is not something he has learned reading a report which has given him by some secretary. It is not something he has read in newspapers or see on TV. When he became archbishop, he left not only the residence of the Argentinian uh, bishops, he, he decided to live uh, at the last store uh, 
of the courier in a two-flat apartment. Already there, he chose a very simple life. But he renounced the chauffeur and he renounced the car. So he was using day by day only the metro and the bus. And he was going every week to these shanty towns, to these slums which are around Buenos Aires, and which are really towns of 40, 50, 60,000 people, uh, full of violence, full of solidarity, full of sense of religiousness, but also uh, places where there are drug dealers, where there are feuds between clans, where houses are burnt in clashes, where uh, boys come to th their parish priests and hug him, but in the same time they have the gun in the jacket, and where there are uh, sometimes very, very tough uh, and unhuman uh, conditions. This makes it why Pope Francis, speaking to the US Congress or to the UN Assembly, when he says that there are great social issues, he always underlines it's not abstract issues. It goes about men and women, real men and real women, who are living, striving, and suffering. It's really noticeable, for example, that he is a man of the city and a man close to the people when, for example, on positions on immigration come to the fore and you see he, he does feel it personally. His parents were immigrants. He has been talking with immigrants personally. And maybe you could say something about how he has uh, moved the conversation um, about the moral dimensions of some of these international issues, like the need to be welcoming to the immigrant or to uh, take care of the earth um, in his Laudato Si. It, uh, it is certain uh, noticeable that the way Pope Francis came to the United States, he didn't come to teach lessons. It, this shows also the complex personality of Pope Francis. Pope Francis is a man of prayer, and at the same time he has a political mind. He is very simple when he speaks, but he's not a simpleton. So when he came to the White House, he said, I'm here like a brother, and then I'm here like son of immigrants, remembering and reminding how this great nation has been built by different and various waves of immigrants. Um, Francis especially wants to remind that today the issue of a great wave of millions of people moving from one country to another, from the poorest country to the first world, to the northern hemisphere, is not, is not a detail. It is a historical moment in which these people, either because of wars or because of misery, are trying to build a better life. So what is important for him is to remind people that one must not make as if things were in order. This is one of his sentences. Because one could overlook things and saying things are OK or everything will, everybody will try his way. He wants to underline that there are great social issues of real inequality which have to be solved. He doesn't want and he doesn't think that it is up to the church to give recipes. It is up to the citizens, it is up to the political leadership. But it is up to the voters and to the political leadership to cope with these problems, not to close their eyes and to give answers. In the same time, for instance, when he has written his encyclical about climate change, about ecology, he didn't do it from an ideological point of view, but he thinks, as he has said repeatedly, that deterioration of environment has social effects, has a social impact. So if there is, for instance, a desertification in some parts of the world, this will urge people to move because they can't anyway do agriculture. If there is a pollution, this has a social impact. 
in this encyclical, what is inter interesting is that it is the first time that the Pope doesn't has a point of departure, a dogma or the doctrine, and then he tries to teach the science what to do, like it was with Galileo Galilei, but it is just the other way around. It is the first time a Pope bases a reflection on scientific studies and then says how you have to act morally, how a Christian has to act following the gospel and uh, following the main principle, love your neighbor and do something against the deterioration which, as he has told to the UN Assembly, produces a relentless marginalization. It strikes me that he is someone who is so idealistic on a certain front, uh, at least constantly exhorting everyone to an attitude of hope. And yet, he's a canny politician, as you say, and he is very pragmatic. Certainly, he's not an idealistic personality. He speaks of values. He, he wants to be, as all the popes, a voice of conscience and a a moment of reflection, of meditation about the issues. And he's really realistic because this was his experience as Archbishop in uh, Buenos Aires. But in same time, he is fully aware that one of the dangers of present uh, political, socio-political situation is fundamentalism. And as he said very clearly, First of all, this risk, this danger is present in all religions. So he didn't hide this fact, in all religions. And he means it that beginning from his own religion, there can be fundamentalism in Catholic religion, Christian religion, Jewish, Muslim religion. We have seen even, even in, in, in Buddhist countries where it should be unthinkable that there is a fundamentalism, like in Birmania, in Myanmar, you have seen all of a sudden in the last years that there is an explosion of fundamentalism. Or in the last 20 years we have seen an explosion of fundamentalism in India, for instance, when never in the Indian culture, which was so polytheistic, there was an idea of fundamentalism, and you have it. So for the Pope, political, religious, or also economical fundamentalism is a great danger. And this means that he always urges not to think in stereotypes. And he himself must not be seen in stereotype. Because, for instance, people see him always smiling and with great contact with the people. But he wasn't so in Buenos Aires. He had to learn now to be more open to, to the crowds. In Buenos Aires, if you see the pictures, you almost can't find a picture where he is smiling he, because he is also an introverted nature, a meditative nature. He was in Germany a couple of months studying after his failure as superior general of the Jesuits. Also, this was important in his formation. And he has told it autocritically, and he has told it when he was pope. You know, generally, if you get a higher position, you try to hide the dark or the gray pages of your biography. He did it just the opposite. When he became pope, he gave an interview to all the Jesuits magazines all over the world, and he was speaking that when he was superior general, he had been too authoritarian, and that later on he had understood that it is a fault to be authoritarian, and now he says, when I have to take a decision, I don't take the first decision which comes in my mind, but I stay a little bit longer, I listen to people, and then I take a decision. Everybody knows he left the papal apartments, uh, not because the papal apartments are especially luxurious, but he didn't want to live in a sort of ivory tower where nobody has access and where it becomes Dangerous that somebody, maybe your secretary, decides who has access or not to the Pope. So he said, for me it's important to stay with the people. He said it's also a psychiatric issue. I need to be among the people. 
and he stays in this guest house, which is like a normal hotel. There is a normal restaurant. In the evening, there is a self-service. He goes with his tray and takes his things. The Argentinian friends, of course, make a joke. They say he stays there so he can't be poisoned because he eats with the other people. <laughs> but uh, one of the poets he likes uh, especially, German poets he likes especially, is the poet uh, Hölderlin, who wrote uh, one many beautiful poems. But one is especially important because it's a poem dedicated to the destiny of the human beings. And it begins how the gods, the Greek gods, live well in the air and they are like uh, babies who have no preoccupation, no concern at all. But we human beings are like the water of a waterfall who is falling down and down for always, for all the years. So he has also a pessimistic uh, comprehension of the things. And when he speaks even about the devil, some people was laughing, what is he coming now? He's so pragmatic, he's so, she's, he speaks contemporary language, but he's, from time to time he quotes the devil. And, and this means that he wants to remember that one has not to have too much optimism because in the human history and in the human nature there can be a dark side of something beastly, of something of an animal who is cruel, who, who makes bad things. And it is necessary also to think about that. What do you make of his own position as someone who wants so much to advance you know, what you call a program for a revolution in the church in a probably short time that he has limited to him, that, that he has to him, and yet is the head of a multinational conglomerate himself that is famous for hierarchy, for pronouncements, for red tape. Yes, he makes the same critics, uh, critical remarks also to his priests and to his bishops. He says you must not only put up programs or just uh, write statistics to see whether one program went well and the other maybe could be improved. He wants action and he wants uh, that everybody is a real witness of, of the gospel from his, as he is a religious leader. Of course, he has a, a tough program of change. Somebody told me in this trip, in these conversations, maybe it is too, too broad a program because he's not concentrating only on one issue. This pope wants to reshape the papacy. The papacy must not be anymore an imperial monarchic papacy. The church must be more communitarian, the Catholic Church must be more communitarian, must be more participatory. He wants to implement a great principle of Vatican Council II, which was the principle of collegiality. Collegiality means that the bishops are not local governors or prefects of the Church, and that the Pope is like the Emperor who gives order, but as Vatican Council II said, the bishops are the descendants of the apostles. So the church has to be led by Peter and by the apostles, by the pope with the bishops. And the bishops represent the local churches. The bishops should represent all the variety of this multinational reality of more than a billion and 200 million of believers and of followers. But this, for instance, just only this, is a hard task because the Roman Curia and the self-comprehension of papacy for many Catholics, for many uh, part of the clergy, for the bishops and uh, majority of cardinals, has been built up during centuries as a very strong centralized system of command. The Curia is the high chief of the staffs of an army who command. The Pope wants to change this. He, he wants to change it because he understands that maybe if uh, a foreign leader comes to the Vatican, he is impressed, of course, by Michelangelo, by these beautiful rooms, also by the moral leadership of the Popes. But 
modern society, especially the youth, wants more the gospel, is no more fascinated only by the strength of an ideology, by this icon of the almighty pope. So he wants to reshape, in this sense, the Catholic Church to uh, make it more participatory. The pope wants to give, uh, to empower the bishops to make proposals to solve this problem. But as this is a typical revolution from above, it is the emperor who gives freedom to the representatives of his organization, it may happen that the majority of the people who are afraid of the changes or who are against of the changes or who are too doctrinarians or too are conservatives stop this movement. So in this moment there is a great fight within the church between the reform-minded uh, bishops and cardinals and the pope and uh, a strong core of conservatives. After all these applauses he has got here and in other parts of the world and in Rome every Sunday, he is rather alone in the Roman Curia. He is in minority. Of course, the Roman Curia must not be as a stereotype. There are reform-minded. But in general, the Pope is still minority within the structure, within the apparatus of this great organization, of this great multinational organization. I was uh, six years uh, correspondent in Moscow. It was a moment when I didn't deal about the Vatican and I was in Moscow. I couldn't understand well the Kremlin because I knew the Vatican and when I came back I understood even better the Vatican <laughs> after having lived around the Kremlin. But uh, there is something which reminds me the story of Gorbachev. He was trying to democratize a huge apparatus. But the moment when he gave freedom to this apparatus, the, in the first moment, the majority was against him. And he was ousted. Then finally, anyway, the conservatives couldn't block the change, the historic change. And Russia went with Yeltsi to become a democratic state or a half democratic state, but anyway, overcoming the old totalitarianism. Something is like that is happening also now. The conservatives are very aggressive for many reasons. There are conservatives in absolute good faith. They fear, they fear what they call also a, a protestantization of the church. And they think that one has to stick to old doctrine, to old tradition. They don't understand that uh, the contemporary society needs less, less power rituals and less uh, arid declarations and needs more witnesses. What the Pope calls the church has to be a, a field hospital, someone who helps the wounded of the society, not even looking if they are Catholics or non Catholics. So these conservatives are very aggressive. You can see it very much on the internet websites. There are little splitter groups which now are fueled by cardinals and bishops. I repeat, not only in Rome, all over the world, in the Universal Church, in the United States. And these websites are very aggressive against the Pope. They say that he is diminishing the sacrality of the papacy, that he is diminishing the primacy of the Pope, because the Pope must be the absolute ruler of Catholicism. They blame him for speaking too much about poverty. They say it's pauperism, that he's a demagogue, that he speaks only like the crowd wants, that he is too much feminist. Imagine. So uh, this, there is a very aggressive uh, wave against the Pope, also because the Pope in his long agenda, uh, for instance, wants the bishop to be less Renaissance princes, as he say, princes, as he say, less bureaucrats, uh, but more living with the flock, living with the people. He wants the priests not to be uh, only functionaries, 
people of a staff. He wants them not to be narcissists, not to be self-centered, but to live with the sheep, as he says. He says always that the shepherd has to smell like the sheep. <laughs> and he has also said that sometimes the sheep, shepherd must be at the avant-garde of the flock to lead the way, sometimes in the middle to hold it together, but sometimes also he has to leave the flock to go forwards because the flock, this means the lay people, the believers, maybe have a better sense of where to go. When he touches all these issues, when he says, for instance, that women have to go in places where they decide or exert authority, this means not, doesn't, it doesn't mean women ordination, but it means that in the organization of the church, the women must have leadership, something which is abhorred by the uh, macho style old guard who fears women in such a position. Or when he makes a great cleanup of the Vatican Bank, or when he's very strong against corruption, then there is the opposition of the old guard. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.